So this screencast will provide an introduction to drawing and interpreting skeletal structures as appropriate for our first year organic chemistry modules. And I'll also give you some tips and pitfalls to avoid along the way. So skeletal structures are basically a shorthand that we use in organic chemistry, because if we had to draw other molecules like this, it would take us ages to convey anything. So we make a number of approximations and simplifications. So first of which is using atom labels and drawing in our bonds as simple lines. Um, we may use group labels such as CH3 here, which again is reducing the number of bonds we have to draw. We may start to approximate the shape of the molecule, which makes it clearer. And we may start to imply atoms like losing uh, carbon atoms or losing hydrogen atoms. And that makes the structure a lot simpler to interpret, but also a lot simpler to draw. Now, at school, you probably saw a lot of structures that look like this over on the left here. Um, but when you get to degree and becoming a professional chemist, skeletal structures are the order of the day. Um, and I'll show a number of reasons why that is as we go through. So basically, skeletal structures are allowing us to communicate quickly and concisely. So here's an example. This is the same molecule drawn two different ways. Um, one of which is drawing out all of the atoms and bonds, and one of which is a fully skeletal structure. Now, in the left-hand structure, we've got 14 atoms and 14 bonds to draw. Whereas in the right-hand structure, we've only got to draw two atoms, the oxygens, and seven bonds. So obviously, it's a lot quicker to draw this sort of structure. Uh, also, the structure on the left is comparatively messier, right? There's a lot more going on. It's a lot harder to pick out the details in what you're looking at here. Whereas the structure on the right is quite neat. But most importantly, both of these structures contain the same level of information, providing you can interpret this skeletal structure in the correct way. Now, this is where my first tip comes in. Uh, a lot of people who are new to skeletal structures um, either lose or gain carbons when they're interpreting them. So my top tip is to think of it like join the dots. Okay, So when you're counting carbons, count the ends of the bonds, not the bonds themselves. So in this molecule, we can see we've got one, two, three, four carbons. If you count the ends of the bonds rather than the bonds themselves, one, two, three, four. Okay. And the reverse is true if you're drawing skeletal structures, right? If you convert all of your carbons into dots and then join them together with lines, you'll end up with something which is closer to a fully skeletal structure. Now, as well as implying carbon atoms, we can also imply hydrogens. But hydrogens that are connected to what we call heteroatoms, and that basically means any atom that's not carbon, um, most often in organic chemistry that will mean nitrogen or oxygen, are always drawn in. But any hydrogen atom that's attached to a carbon, unless it's needed for clarity, uh, is usually implied. So a good rule of thumb for this one is if you think that neutral carbon always makes four bonds, so four minus the number of bonds that are actually drawn to that carbon on your structure gives you the number of hydrogens that are bonded to that carbon but have been made implicit in the skeletal structure. So if we look at the structure below, um, the carbon atom on the very end here has one bond drawn into it. So four minus one gives us three. So there are three hydrogens on this carbon at the end. This is a CH3 group. If we move along to this guy in the middle, then it's got two bonds drawn in now. So four minus two gives us two hydrogens which are implied and not actually drawn into the structure. And if we go through the rest of the structure, um, we can see the rest of the implicit hydrogens where they are. So it's all, always useful to bear this in mind when you're, especially when you get new to skeletal structures. Um, don't forget that when you're looking at a skeletal structure like this, the hydrogens haven't gone anywhere. We've just made them implicit. So there is one hydrogen attached to this carbon, for instance, whereas this carbon over here doesn't have any attached. So here are some examples of how um, implying carbon and hydrogen atoms makes things neater. You can see this is actually a relatively simple molecule, um, but it looks quite messy. Um, whereas if we make it into a skeletal structure, it becomes much neater. When we start to get more complicated molecules like this, we're actually now starting to lose some of the information here. We're starting to, uh, things are starting to get a bit complicated. You know, it's difficult to pick out the oxygen atoms, for instance, in this sea of carbons. Whereas when we make things skeletal, everything becomes a lot clearer and it's a lot easier to see functional groups like this, for instance. And when we get onto very complex molecules, actually non-skeletal structures like this can no longer really work. 
Um, you can see you've got overlapping bonds here. Everything's too crowded. You can't see what's going on. So in, in molecules like this, we actually need skeletal structures to make them legible at all. So it's a good, um, a good thing to get into early on before you get, deal with more complex molecules like this. So another thing which helps to make your skeletal structures clear and accurate is using the correct bond angles. If we look at a molecular structure of triple bonded carbon, we can see uh, that it's linear. Right? It's a straight line. So as a result, our skeletal structures should reflect that and our bond angle should be 180 degrees. Right? So anything connected through a triple bonded carbon should be linear. If we look at double bonded carbon here, um, this is trigonal planar. So if we look at it upside on, we can see that it's planar. If we look at it top on, we can see that it's trigonal. So this should be reflected in our skeletal structure and the bond angle should be about 120 degrees. If we look at all single bonded carbon, uh, we can see now that this is tetrahedral. Uh, so the bond angles here are about 109.5 degrees. And how we accurately draw this on the page uh, is a bit more complicated. But for simple structures, we basically just try and approximate the uh, tetrahedral geometry. So this is where you get a little bit of artistic interpretation. You might draw them like this. You might draw them in a more symmetrical form like this, or you might draw them in a way which approximates the tetrahedral geometry. Um, whichever looks best in the structure at hand, basically, as any of these are correct. So here are some examples of how uh, correcting bond angles can make the structures look much nicer. So here's a fairly poorly drawn molecule, uh, but if we correct the bond angles, everything becomes a lot clearer. Similarly, We've got a poorly drawn molecule here, and this looks like a lot of things that I mark in exams and so on. But by correcting all the bond angles, it looks a lot neater. This also helps with things like counting carbons. Um, if you've got the structure drawn out nice and neat uh, with the correct bond angles, there's a lot less chance that you're going to uh, drop any carbons or gain any carbons. And finally, we've got this structure here, which actually, because the bond angles have been drawn incorrectly here, uh, we've lost information out of this structure because this structure could be either of these two compounds, which are geometric isomers of each other. But the way it was drawn originally, we have no idea which is which. And the, these two compounds are different. They will have different properties and so on. So it is important that we express ourselves clearly and accurately. So another issue that all single bonded carbon presents us with is how we accurately represent a three-dimensional shape on a two-dimensional surface, like a screen or a piece of paper. So if we look at our tetrahedral carbon here, um, we need a way of expressing this three-dimensionality on the page, um, and this is most important when we deal with stereochemistry. So the way we deal with three-dimensionality is using wedge and hash bonds. So if we take the structure on the left here, if we were to draw this as a skeletal structure, we would draw it something like this where any regular bonds are considered to be in the plane of the paper or the screen. Uh, the wedge bond, which is this one here, is coming out of the plane towards you. So this is coming out of your screen towards your face. Whereas the hash bond here is going into this plane away from you. So into your screen, into the paper, away from you. And you can see uh, this has been color matched over here. So A is the red atom. You can see it's coming towards you and B is the blue atom, you can see it's going away from you uh, into the plane. So this is most important when we're dealing with issues like stereochemistry. So we've got a molecule here which is chiral, it's got a stereocenter here, and how we represent this in skeletal structures is really important. So if we're not bothered about the stereochemistry, then this is a perfectly valid skeletal structure. Um, but this carbon here is a stereocenter. It has a specific configuration. Um, so usually the stereochemistry is important. So we would express it like this, with a wedge bond on the uh, OH group and a hash bond on the methyl group, because it's going away from you and the OH group's coming towards you. But there are a number of different ways that you could express this, um, depending on the kind of view that you take. So this is fine, because this is the view that we have of the molecule as it is. But we could also draw it like this. So the OH is still on a wedge bond, it's just kind of swapped sides now. And this is basically changing your viewpoint from here to looking at it from this side. So twisting the three-dimensional structure to the side a little bit. You've not changed the molecule at all. All you're doing is changing your viewpoint from the right to the left a little bit. Similarly, 
this structure here is fine. This is exactly the same molecule, it's just been viewed from behind. You can see the carbonyl group, right? the chain that's got the carbonyl group, has moved over to the site, and the OH and the methyl have swapped over. That's because we're viewing this molecule now from behind. So if we flip it 180 degrees, we're viewing it from behind, so now the methyl group is pointing towards us, and the OH group is pointing away. So I'll go back. This is the original image. Here we're viewing it from behind. So that's still a perfectly accurate depiction of that molecule. You're just viewing it from the opposite side. Similarly, this is the molecule just rotated. So we've rotated the molecule in the plane of the, the screen. You can see that the carbonyls rotated around so that it's on this side and it's facing upwards. Um, and we can see if we rotate the three-dimensional structure, this is again an accurate representation. OH towards us, methyl away. Everything's fine. What's not okay is this structure over here. All right? This is the molecule in the same orientation, but we've actually flipped this stereocenter here. Okay, so this is telling us that the OH is going away and the methyl group's coming towards. That's a different compound. Okay, that's the enantiomer of this molecule here. So this is what we have to look out for. There's lots of different interpretations you can have, but if you draw something like this, actually the molecule you're drawing is not this, it's this one. All right, and you can see that you flip the configuration at that stereocenter there. So all of these are kind of artistic interpretation, if you like. You know, it depends on which angle you want to draw the molecule from, but make sure that your um, your stereochemical configuration is accurately portrayed by your um, skeletal structure. So we only use wedge and hash bonds when required. You could draw a structure like this, which is a beautiful three-dimensional representation of the molecule. Um, technically correct, but unnecessarily complex. You don't need to include that level of information. So uh, normal skeletal structures are absolutely fine unless we need the wedge and hash bonds and it's usually to show stereochemistry. So this molecule here um, could be any of four possible stereoisomers because there's two uh, chiral centers in this molecule. So it could be this, 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 or this. Um, so you would need to draw out specifically which structure you were, were talking about. Um, if you were to draw a structure like this, you would generally mean that it was a mixture of all of these. So the other final thing to notice on um, wedge and hash bonds is that you can still use implicit hydrogens. So if we draw a structure like this, um, it's implied that the implicit hydrogen that's there is on the hash bond. So if your group is on a wedge bond, the implicit hydrogen is on a hash bond, and vice versa. So the group here is on a hash bond, so the implicit hydrogen must be on a wedge bond. So you don't need to draw both a wedge and a hash bond in for every single carbon. So the final thing I want to talk about to tidy up your structures is labels, and we'll start with formula labels. So if you've got a functional group like this amine over here, you don't need to draw in both of the NH bonds uh, unless you need them for a mechanism or something like that. So you can actually abbreviate this as a formula label NH2, and that has all the information in it. So it, you know that the, the two bonds to the hydrogen are coming from the nitrogen. So if you need to flip that label over, and this is a common mistake that I see, so this is why I'm pointing it out, you need to reverse the label um, so that the connectivity is correct. So you've got a carbon-nitrogen bond here, so that should be reflected in the, uh, the structure when you've reversed it. Okay, so that is correct. Um, what you shouldn't do is draw things like this. Here you've got a carbon being bonded weirdly to two hydrogens. Um, you should always retain your, your connectivity in your original functional group. So reverse your label, um, don't draw things like this. Similarly, don't reverse the entire label. Um, so chemical nomenclature still applies. Um, a subscript number to the right of an atom indicates that there's more than one of that atom. So the subscript number here should be to the right of the hydrogen. You don't reverse the entire label um, as it is. So that's also incorrect. So another example here, we've got a carboxylic acid group. We can abbreviate that as CO2H. So if we were to reverse that label, it would look something like this. So again, maintain your connectivity, right? Your bonding between the carbon and the carbon, not the carbon and the hydrogen. And also don't reverse the entire label like that. Okay, because there's two oxygens in this functional group. So the two should be to the right of the oxygen atom. 
The final thing I want to talk about is named group labels. So certain groups in organic chemistry have been given names. So the highlighted group here in purple is a tosylate group, which is abbreviated as TS. Um, so in contrast to, to formula labels, named group labels are just a name that we've given something. It's not expressing a chemical formula as such. We're just saying that this chemical formula we're going to abbreviate as you know, uh, a code or a letter. So we can draw this structure over here like this, where we've abbreviated our uh, structure of the tosylate group as TS. So again, if we want to reverse the structure, um, we, we reverse the structure as is, but we don't reverse the letters in the um, name group label because tosylate, TS stands for tosylate, you wouldn't reverse the S and the T, for instance. So this is okay, you wouldn't draw something like that. So you don't have to draw the bonds in as well, so you can abbreviate further. So NHTS, this is basically similar to the uh, functional group label we saw on the previous uh, slide. And we can also actually abbreviate this part of the molecule as well, because this is a phenyl group, which we can abbreviate as pH. So now we've got a very highly abbreviated molecule. And actually, if we lose the bond out of there as well, you can abbreviate this entire molecule as this very short string of letters. So now it's up to you to strike a balance between brevity and clarity, I guess. You know, if you need any of these functional groups here to do any mechanisms in, obviously you should draw them out. Um, but looking at something like this, it's not immediately clear what the chemical structure is. Um, you know, you're going to have to do a little bit of mental working out to, to think about what this is. So sometimes it's actually clearer to draw some of the structure out. You can, you can over abbreviate if you like. So final example, if we take this molecule down here, um, then this side of the molecule uh, is a benzar group, which you can abbreviate as BN. It's a benzene ring and a CH2. Um, we can then take the bond out of it to abbreviate it like this. And then this side of the molecule over here is an ethyl group, which abbreviates as ET. So we can either draw it with the bond in or without. But again, just to reiterate that point, if you do flip a structure over, which has got named group labels in, don't flip the uh, the letters in the label. So it's still BN, not NB, and it's still ET, not TE. Okay. So that's how named group labels differ from functional group labels. So these kind of group abbreviation labels um, come in really handy when you've got complex molecules like this. So this is Paclitaxel. Um, looking at the molecule as is, it's a skeletal structure, but it's still quite complex. There's a lot of groups that are quite close together. But by abbreviating some of these, then we can make the chemical structure a lot simpler. Um, and for instance, if we're focusing on a part of the structure that isn't abbreviated, it makes it much clearer than if you'd got all the groups drawn in like this.